ability. So years later, probably the late 70s, I was approached by a group of youth sportsmen. Uh, the ringleaders, there were others, but the ringleaders were Tom Buny, the late Tony Shonen, and the, the late Jerry Manley. And I'd like to introduce the heirs, Chris Buny, would you stand, son of Tom, and Jack Shunan, son of Tony. They're great guys. Montana. My 
father was not really big on trophy fish. He liked to catch big fish, but then he liked to eat the fish. He gave them away. So one time my good buddy Jess Frisbee from McAllister was there, and Dad, when he was alive, said, oh, you've got to see this fish. And he went down to the freezer in the basement and pulled up this fish that was obviously too long for the freezer because it was in a sea shape, totally frozen. And he said, look at this, that was his trophy fish. <laughs> Jess just shook his head. But I have the next slide. This is my dad's idea of a trophy fish. That was given to him by his buddy from Butte C.P. Lee. Uh, and that had a place in the uh, Long Branch Saloon that had us for quite some time. That's the closest dad ever came to trophy fishing. Um, well, anyway, when I was hired by the Coalition for Stream Access, I set about researching the law and developing a strategy. And I learned some very interesting history. And if you pull up the next slide, there's a case called Martin v. Waddell from 1842. And what it says is when each of the original 13 colonies declared their independence, they became themselves sovereign and in that character hold the absolute right to all their navigable waters and stoic soils other than for their own common use. And the importance of that is when the 13 colonies broke away from Mother England, at that time, the Tidelands were owned by the sovereign, the king of England. The, the colonies, therefore, there was no federal government, let us speak of, took over that ownership and it, it became ownership not only of the tidelands, but also of the navigable streams. So that's the 13 colonies. Now the next step is what happens to Montana, Nebraska, and these other states which were not the original 13. And the answer was found in 1845 in the case Pollard v. Hogan. And that says these states, those states entering the Union after 1789, did so on a quote equal footing with the original 13 possession, possessing the same ownership over sovereignty rights. So when Montana came into the Union in 1889, to the extent that rivers were navigable, the bed of, and the waters became the property of the state of Montana which is true of all the later United States. Uh, now, the one interesting aspect that's uh, interesting to Montanans is that back in the early 70s, there was a major case on the Bighorn River, which flows out of Wyoming and through the Crow Reservation. And the Crow tribes tried to prohibit or regulate non-members from use of the Bighorn River. And eventually, the Crow tribe, joined by the United States, sued the state of Montana over the ownership of the Bighorn River stream bed. And there, the court applied the same formula that we see here. The, the court held that although the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851, the later Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, that created the Crow Reservation, and set aside those lands for exclusive use of the Crow tribe. But did that mean the rivers? And the court, the US Supreme Court said no, they reversed our Ninth Circuit. And the US Supreme Court said no, there's not enough there in that treaty language to defeat this presumption that all navigable waters are held by the federal government in trust for when the states come into the Union. So this, the U.S. Supreme Court, in that case, sided with the state of Montana, which is why the Bighorn River is now not precluded from, from non-Indian fishing. Now, that's a side excursion to what we did. Uh, 
but it's, it's an important issue because of the Big Horn River. Um, now, the next slide is something called the Daniel Ball case. That's the name of a, I think, a boat. And it basically said that these, those rivers must be regarded as public navigable rivers in law which are navigable in fact. And that became known as the navigability of fact, in fact, test. That is, if the, if the stream is usable for navigation, then it's navigable in fact. Now, now there are other cases that branched off from this Daniel Wall, and curiously, there are two types of, at least two types of navigability. One is for tidal, which I've been talking about, who owns this stream bed. And the other is federal jurisdictional navigation for regulatory purposes, like the old Federal Power Act and all kinds of Corps of Engineers regulations that follow the U.S. Commerce Clause. And they all use this navigability in fact test, but there are differences. One major difference is that for tidal, there has to be uh, navigability in fact, at the time of statehood, whereas for federal jurisdiction, commerce clause jurisdiction, it can be any time, and it can be streams that are developed to be navigable and didn't have to be in the natural forms. Um, now, I prepared this research strategy memo, and what I said, bring up that other slide, please. In the first paragraph, the goal of this group is to establish in the state an expanded legal right on the part of the public to access. And then I discuss various theories. And you can see there that I uh, was leery about the title test that I've been talking about. And one of the problems is that when Montana was admitted to the Union shortly after. It ceded all the land to the low water mark to the riparian owner. So title was a problem for us. There was an 1895 case, Gibson v. Kelly, which talked about the ownership only to the low water mark. So we were a little worried about title and that theory. So I developed some other theories, like public use, public easement type theories, and eventually we did develop the public trust theory. But then at the bottom, this is more tactical. You see, <laughs> I say, care should be taken in selecting the right defendant. Find one rich enough and irascible enough to take the case all the way. Find one who will not have the sympathy of the judge. And Donald Trump wasn't available at the time. <laughs> Public access. 
Yeah, but with the beaver head, we didn't have any evidence of commercial use other than outfitters. Lewis and Clark, I think, went up to beaver head, but we just didn't have the kind of saw log evidence that we had on the deer point, so that gave us a nice two different types of cases to develop. And um, so what happened after that, by the way, it's showing that we chose the right asshole on the deer point, was Dennis Curran sued the coalition for stream access for $10 million in a counterclaim. <laughs> and we, uh, I called my clients and I said, I have bad news and good news. And they said, well, what's the bad news? And I said, the bad news is you've been sued for $10 million counterclaim. They said, well, what's the good news? And I said, well, I think I can settle it for less than that. <laughs> Picture this: the coalition for stream access <laughs> didn't have any money. They were scraping to pay me, <laughs> and of course, Current had no evidence that would support his counterclaim. Maybe in this day and age, you can kind of read his mind. That's what I see in the paper. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we commissioned uh, a historian named Al Noel from the Story Research Associates in Missoula. He had already done some, some work bringing up that other stuff, not a big one. And you can see from his report, <coughs> he starts during the years 88 and 89, there were log drives down the Deer Park. And this is from, from the Great Falls Tribune at the time. And you can see in the blog post that some detail on the drive. But the problem, the other side argued, is, well, you don't tell us exactly where these logs were floated. Now, common sense tells us they floated from where the area is forested, mostly way upstream. <coughs> but we didn't have the precise evidence of Curran's property and the river running through it being the subject of this. So Al Newell went back to the drawing board. And he came up with some more research. And this is, oh, yeah. this is what he found from a, somebody in the 30s who recalled growing up in the area. And he said it was in April or early May of 87, he was at the Dearborn Crossing and saw all these logs coming down. And all this historic evidence is probative of the question. And that was the zinger that we needed because Dearborn Crossing. Can pull up that map the next one. If you look up right on the left hand side, you see Highway 287 going up where it crosses the Blue River with the <coughs> yellow arrow, arrow. That's where Highway, that's the old Dearborn Crossing. The old Helena to Fort Benton Road cross right there. And if you look at the white squares, those are sections then owned by the Dearborn Ranch, which was D. Michael Curran. So that was very probative evidence for us on, on <coughs> commercial, excuse me, commercial use. Now, I took the deposition of asshole number one in Helen, and I didn't expect much because he's from the oil patch, and they don't, uh, the truth is a little foreign to most of those people. <laughs> so his main argument, I asked him, well, what's your theory on the counterplay? And his main argument was, well, it takes two days to float from Highway 287 to Missouri. And so somebody's got to camp out. And it's on my property, usually. And they vandalize the property and so on. <clears throat> well, I have floated that section, and it's easily done in a day. But I, 
I wanted to pin him down on the two days, so I, <coughs> I asked this Brigham. The first set of questions up there, have you ever yourself floated that stretch of the river? Answer yes. <coughs> well, I wasn't much interested in the two days. What I was interested in is go back to the map. The fact that the river goes through his property and then look at all the other property it goes through <coughs> down to the Missouri. Well, how can he claim that people don't have the right to float through his property, but then he has the right to float through others? <laughs> so, bring up that slide. <coughs> Pinned him down. The section is isolated down in this match. And then I said, let's look at the ownership of these places downstream. And he said, I really can't tell you who owns them. So here's the guy who says, I floated from Highway 287 to Missouri. But somehow nobody else gets to float the stretch of his property, even though he doesn't know even who owns the property down below. So we had a little fun with Mr. Kern on that. <laughs> uh, the other interesting thing in preparing for the trial, they brought in, the other side brought in a late witness called, his name was Gus Care, Gus Care Boxes. Gus was uh, from the Corps of Engineers in Omaha and supposedly an affability expert. And so he, I took his deposition. He flew over the river for one day, looked at some stream flow records, and came up and said, by golly, that river is not navigable. So we had a little fun with him and his deposition. I won't go into it. But later, when I argued the case in the Montana Supreme Court, I, somebody asked me, one of the justices asked me about Karabatsis. And I said, oh, he was a prostitute. <laughs> and so Justice Frank Morrison was a pretty good friend of mine. And, he, and Frank was originally from Nebraska. And his father had actually been governor of Nebraska. And he said, well, he can't be all that bad. He's from Nebraska. Hmm. Well, that happened to be two or three weeks in 1984 after Miami had upset the Nebraska Cornhuskers in the Orange Bowl for the national title. So I shot back to Justice Morris and I said, he'd have more credibility if he was from Miami. <laughs> the court enjoyed that one. Uh, so after the argument, the feisty lawyer on the other side came up said, you'll be hearing from us on that, which I took to mean the prosecute comment. So I didn't say anything, but I really thought about it and decided, well, probably it was a bad choice of words. I probably should have called him a lying whore. <laughs> well, ultimately, we won the, the first stream access case, the, the current case, This is the language. And it's very, very broad language for us. First of all, we were a little worried about the recreational use test. That's why we developed the Beaverhead case. There was some precedent for recreational use from Minnesota and other states. But the court adopted the recreational use case and adopted it in very broad terms. They basically held the capability of use of the waters for recreational purposes determines their availability for recreational use by the public. Stream bed ownership, and by the way, the court did agree with us on stream bed ownership. It did agree with us on the saw log floating test. But then it held that's basically irrelevant. <coughs> it's the question of use of the waters. And to the extent that waters are usable for recreational purposes, that's the extent. A very broad, comforting ruling by the court. 
and it held that a private party can't interfere with the public use of the waters. So then we, shortly after that, we tried the uh, Beaverhead River case, and Judge Joe Gary here in Bozeman was the initial judge. He granted a temporary injunction on the uh, opening day of fish, fishing because there was threat of changing across the river. And then the other side substituted Gary out, and he called in Judge Jack Shanstrom from Livingston. Well, Jack Shanstrom was a well-known, avid fisherman, particularly in the Yellowstone River. So later, Judge Gary chuckled at me and he said, well, from the fire, frying pan into the fire. So anyway, Judge Shanstrom ruled in our favor, too. And on the Beaverhead, I've got some language. Uh, they talk about the only possible limitation can be the characters of the water itself. And then at the last sentence of the top quote, the public has the right to use the waters to the bed and banks up to the ordinary high water mark. So notwithstanding that ownership in Montana of the state was only to the low water mark, the uh, this ruling established the high water mark test. And then the last paragraph on the screen talks about barriers to navigation. If there are any, you have the right to portage around them. And then the court in Curran and Hildreth, the Beaver River case, also embraced what is called the public trust doctrine, which I want to get to in a minute. But if we look at slide, the next one, 16. The Montana Constitution talks about the surface waters and the all waters are property of the state subject to beneficial use. And I've thrown in uh, <coughs> a term called Usufruct, would you go to page 19, slide 19. Usufruct, which is probably not a term that most people are familiar with. It's a legal term. But it basically, as you can see in the deposition, uh, the, uh, the, the screen, it's a legal right according to a person or a party that confers the temporary right to use or derive income or benefit. And it comes from the term Usus and fructus, Latin terms. But that's what water is, really. You don't own the water. You have, if you have a water right, you own a water right. And the standard Montana Western water laws, you have to put it to beneficial use. If you don't, you lose it. And if you abandon it, you can abandon it. So it's not like land ownership. So that's kind of the, the trust issue in the Montana Constitution. It's, it, the water is owned by the state for the beneficial use of the people. So, uh, so I want to spend just a minute or two on the public trust fund. Because it's become very, very important. And the next slide, uh, because the, the Hildreth and Kern cases largely centered on what's called the public trust. Well, what is the origin of the public trust? It's kind of a doctrine going back to Justinian law in ancient Rome and then English common law. And its, uh, its provenance is a little controversial. But anyway, Montana really embraced the public trust doctrine. And one of the cases that established the public trust is Illinois Central Railroad v. Illinois. And I've got the language there, I won't read it. But basically, what happened is, through some kind of corrupt shenanigans by the legislature, 
a bunch of Chicago lake frontage on Lake Michigan was donated to, by the state to the, or given to the city of Chicago, which in turn ended up with the Illinois Central Railroad. And the court, and the, then a subsequent legislature, <coughs> tried to overturn that. And the court then upheld the subsequent legislature based on what's now known as the public trust doctrine, that the waters and the harbors are so important to the public that they can't be, uh, the, the interests can't be abdicated by the state. And so that became a very central theme in our stream access cases. And if you go to slide 20, <clears throat> recently many of you have probably seen this New York Times article just from a week and a half ago. It's about the state of Colorado. And if you look at the first sentence, here is an advocate, a lawyer for the Colorado water users saying, the main concern is that Colorado not open the door to the public trust doctrine. They don't want any Montana down there. And then at the end, it's one that the water community views as a threat. So the public trust doctrine, important in Montana, important nationally, <coughs> is controversial in Colorado and elsewhere. And I started wondering about it. Well, how, how solid are we on the public trust doctrine? So I went back and reread Curran. And if you would go back to that uh, slide on there. language from, from the current case, the Dearborn River case. You can see about four lines from the bottom of the Constitution and the public trust. So my question is, is Montana dependent? Is the public trust doctrine dependent on the Montana Constitution? Is that its legal origin? And the reason I ask that is because there's been a lot of talk lately that the Republicans are trying to get a super majority so they can modify the Montana Constitution. And mostly it's because of the privacy provision and the abortion of the Armstrong ruling. But the Constitution on the waters might be also vulnerable. But what I like about this is <coughs> the word and, which means to me disjunctive. So the public trust, the, the ruling in, in the Dearborn River case is based on the Constitution, the Montana Constitution, and the public trust document. It would say the public trust doctrine has based on the Montana Constitution is disjunctive. So even if the legislature takes a stab, either legislatively or constitutional amendment to change this, I think we have this very good language, and I think the public trust doctrine does, does it is incredibly helpful to us on that score. Now, I want to just talk briefly after we won Kern and Hildreth, then the 1985 legislature met in a very factious session. And the, uh, some of the ag interests came out in force. They were arguing about people would float in their hay fields and their irrigation district and ditches, etc. Particularly a group in uh, Sweetgrass County. The main uh, mainstream agricultural interests back when they were sane Republicans uh, actually agreed that, that they need legislation 
And at that time, I was sort of indifferent because the Dearborn River case was so broad that we were in the driver's seat. And so legislation, in fact, was a bit of a compromise. We lost some things. But it's better to have a law on the books on it. So it finally passed after very contentious. One of the ringleaders against it was Jack Galt, uh, who was then a major rancher in Moore County. And I later went on a trip, maybe about the same time, headed by the Justice Frank Morris and his wife to the Soviet Union in China. And Jack Galt and his wife, Louise Rankin, the former Wellington Rankin wife, were with us on the tour. So I remember the oddity of sitting there in the Leningrad, it was then called Leningrad Airport, drinking a Russian beer with Jack Colt, who was a pretty courtly gentleman, even though he was a fierce opponent, debating stream access in Montana. <laughs> but anyway, the legislature, legislation passed. It was challenged. Fishing game defended it. Mostly the law was upheld with some minor changes. And then one other footnote, <laughs> in around 2000-2002, a group, one of these right-wing uh, public interest law firms, challenged uh, streams of uh, access on the uh, Odell Creek of uh, Venice, the Stillwater River over by Columbus, and the Ru excuse me, the Ruby, and on a sort of a constitutional takings theory. We defeated that, and we won in the Ninth Circuit. And that leads me, I want to come back in a few minutes and talk to about one clincher case and then wrap up some comments. But my colleague, Devlin Geddes from my firm, is going to speak for a few minutes on the, what we call the Bridges of Madison County, the Ruby River access cases. <laughs> Devlin is a Montana State graduate, former great Bobcat football player. Two weeks ago, he was inducted into the Bobcat Hall of Fame. He was all-conference defensive end, but more important, he was a, an academic All-American. And Devlin handled the Ruby, I was tired by that time, <laughs> the Ruby River cases. So he's going to talk a few minutes, and then I'll come back and wrap up. Some guiding in his teens on the Ruby. Um, 
So the successor entity to the coalition, Public Lands Water Access Association, of which Tony was the president, came to me and said, what can we do about it? And with the public trust doctrine in mind, I work on easement issues. I kind of thought of the public trust doctrine as being equivalent to an easement. The public has an easement to use the water that we can see in this photo. And then the public has an easement to use the roads. Now, let me go back to the map. Lo and behold, it ended up being a perfect test case because the bottom road there, the Duncan District Road, which was fenced off, was a petitioned county road. The next one to the north was a de dedicated county road. And the last one to the north, Sailor Lane, was a prescriptive road. So we had all three types of public roads available to us to test. And fortunately for us, we had enough um, wealthy out-of-state landowners <laughs> that fenced off these three roads that this became our test uh, case. Uh, but we were tired of suing wealthy out-of-state landowners, so we actually brought the claim against Madison County under the theory that these public easements are for the benefit of the public, so the county should step up and remove any encroachments that prevent the public from using the easement. Madison County said no. Um, and, and Judge Tucker agreed with Madison County, and so we moved to the next step, and that was to involve the, the public landowners. Uh, and the famous name there is uh, James Kennedy of Cox Kennedy Media. So, uh, a billionaire. And so we knew he was taking it to the end, so it was the perfect case. Um, fortunately, we were able to get summary judgment on the uh, per petitioned and the dedicated county roads because Montana law statute says those are all 60 feet run wide. But the Sailor Lane Road is prescriptive, which gave us two things that we were able to test. One, how wide is that prescriptive easement for public purposes? And two, what are the things that a public prescriptive easement can be used for? Because this might be a little dull. Typically, a prescriptive easement is limited to historical uses. So if I walk through your backyard for enough time, I have an easement to walk through your backyard. Public easements can be established in public use, but the question would be, would they be limited to historical public uses? We litigated that case for 13 years with public lands access uh, paying for it, albeit at a significantly reduced rate. The, the theme remained. And uh, ultimately, despite Judge Tucker ruling against us initially, the Montana Supreme Court held that a public prescriptive easement may be used for all purposes, including accessing rivers and streams. The result of those cases result, uh, ended up being codified by the legislature after a couple sessions. I call it the Bridge Access Bill, um, where the uh, legislature agreed with the Supreme Court saying that members of the public may use these, these easements to access rivers and streams of Montana. And then, I think it was about a decade or so after that, there was a second bill that was passed to actually fund the FWP to go in and clean up the uh, fences that might interfere with public use of uh, waterways. Uh, fortunately, to go back to the next slide, uh, hopefully these are a thing of the past. Of the past. Um, I don't think so, because I have fished around the state and I still see issues like this. So I encourage you, if you're out angling or just recreating in our waterways and you see impediments to your access rights on the river, let the FWP know they have a budget for fixing those problems and working with landowners uh, to resolve those issues. Um, again, thanks for being here. Thank you to Jim. I'm going to pass it back to him so he can finish up. Some years ago, a 
lawyer and Helen approached my partner, Brian Gallick, who said, would you raise your then partner, Brian Gallick, saying, well, if the state owns the stream bed, why isn't the state getting rents for the hydroelectric facilities on the stream beds? Uh, which was a good question. And he approached us because we'd done our work on navigability and, and uh, stream access. <clears throat> so we developed a case <clears throat> with the late uh, ex-partner Dick Dolan as lead uh, plaintiff on behalf of the state school trust, suing a number of utilities, including PPLL, saying, you owe the state money. And we had strived mightily to sell this theory to the state attorney general, who was then Mike McGrath, now Chief Justice of the Montana Supreme Court. So I don't want to say anything bad about it. <laughs> but they, they thought we were full of it. And so we proceeded in federal court on the Dolan case. And we did a lot of research, and we survived the motion to dismiss before the federal judge. And then the state got interested, and they came in and took the case away from us, and then Judge Malloy dismissed the Dolan and our clause. So the state took it over, and they ultimately won a, a verdict of over $40 million for the state school trust. Now then, the PPNL appealed that to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, it was argued on the other side by probably the top uh, appellate attorney in the United States, Paul Clement. And the state managed to lose on that appeal. The U.S. Supreme Court held that you can't decide navigability on a total stream basis that you have to do it on a segment-by-segment segment basis. And most of the dams on the Missouri, just below Great Falls, are on rapids that even Lewis and Clark couldn't surmount. They had a portage around 17 miles, as you all know from your history. So they, the U.S. Supreme Court held that's not navigable, reversed on that. But then they sent the case back, remanded it for issues on the Madison Madison Power Dam and the Clark's Fork. And so uh, I think that's still going. Brian's firm is still working on that with others. But what I was really worried when that case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court about what might happen to our stream access victories. So what happened, even though the state lost the case, at the very end of the case, I want to bring up some language. <clears throat> and if you look at the first top line, the public trust doctrine is of ancient origin. Its roots trace to Roman civil law, and its principles can be found in the English common law on public navigation and fishing rights over tidal lands and in the state laws of this country. So that's, that was incredible, even though the state lost that case. The US Supreme Court recognized the ancient public trust doctrine, put its stamp of approval. And why that's important, I mentioned that it's kind of amorphous doctrine. Its provenance is unclear. And by the way, one of the leading scholars is very critical of the public trust doctrine. It's right here in Bozeman, Jim Huffman. He was a college friend of mine, still is a friend of mine. He ended up going to Chicago Law School and was dean for many years at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland. He's written a lot about how bogus the history is, and how terrible. He's, by the way, affiliated with the local political economy resource center, which is a sort of a right of center put it mildly, think tank. Uh, but anyway, he's very critical. So this was the stamp of approval by the US Supreme Court on the doctrine. 
And then if you look in the middle of the court under the case citations, unlike the equal footing doctrine, however, which is the constitutional foundation of the navigability rule of riverbed title, the public trust doctrine remains a matter of state law. So we're, the long and the short of this language, which was almost a footnote, it's at the very end of the opinion, is that the public trust doctrine is alive, it's recognized, and it's up to the states. So in concluding, I just want to stress how important these Supreme Court justice races are, how very important they are. And, you know, we're here in a public forum, I can't tell you who to vote for. I can just tell you, and I can't tell you who I'm going to vote for. Her initials are Ingram Gustafson. It couldn't be more critical. I mean, of course, who we send to Washington is very critical. But this Supreme Court race is very, very critical. And particularly with this rumored effort to try to amend the Constitution. So that's all I had to say. We were lucky in those cases. I was happy to do them. They were fun. And we have, I think, the best stream access laws in the country. Thank you.
There are a lot of things that are barriers to information. So right now we have a situation in higher education where textbooks are super expensive. And students are having to make choices between buying a textbook and buying their dinner. And so one of the things the library has done is we have a grant program about open educational resources. And this might be a new concept to many of you, but basically we can make textbooks that don't have a cost to students. And we can incentivize faculty to adopt <coughs> textbooks that have been vetted, that are nationally, have a reputation on them, if we work together as a university community with other universities. And so over the past three years, we've invested $150,000 to incentivize faculty to adopt freely available textbooks, adapt them to their classes, and ultimately we save students $1.5 million in textbook costs because of that initial investment. So that's a big deal.